Good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, excellencies, colleagues. I'm glad to welcome you to IPI for our discussion today on advancing the measurement of women's inclusion, justice, and security, linking the Women, Peace, and Security Index to Women, Peace, and Security in Practice. I'm Sarah Taylor. I'm the lead on IPI's new Women, Peace, and Security program, and I think we have a great program for you today. Um, in partnership with the Permanent Mission of Norway to the UN and the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, today's timely discussion will dis explore a core women, peace, and security challenge. How do we measure progress and regress on this issue? What do we measure? And crucially, how do, can we use this information to promote and support women's rights, sustainability, and peace? With the new Women, Peace, and Security Index now available from GIWPS and PRIO, I would like to also note that it is hard copies are actually available as you're in the back of the room. Um, we have an important longitudinal data tool at our disposal. To delve into some of the complexities on how we can use this kind of data to implement Women, Peace, and Security um, priorities, we have a wonderful set of panelists for you today, including Dr. Jenny Klugman, Mr. Papasek, and Ms. Lina Abu Habib. But before we get to the panel discussion, I am more than delighted to welcome Her Excellency Ina Eriksson Suride to make opening remarks today. She has been the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Norway since 2017 and is the first woman to hold the position. For more than a decade, she has been a member of the Norwegian Parliament for the Norwegian Conservative Party. After the parliamentary elections in September 2013, she became Minister of Defense. From, 20, from 2009 to 2013, she chaired the Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defense and the Enlarged Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee. This is such a small part of her bio, but I don't want to take up all of the time that she will be speaking to you. Um, and for those of you who were able to join us for our reception in her honor last night, you'll know that the minister is committed to implementing the Women, Peace, and Security agenda. This is, I believe, the third event for you at IPI in about approximately 24 hours, so we're very glad to have you here for this as well. Um, and with that, I would like to welcome you, Minister, to the podium. Thank you. And what she didn't say is that we will continue to meet each other on a weekly basis, <laughs> at least uh, for the next couple of weeks. She's coming to Oslo next week, where we are hosting what I hope will be a very interesting seminar with female mediators, um, global uh, network that we're launching, and it's really going to be very exciting. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very glad and very honored to uh, take this uh, what I like to call roadshow to the US because we've been presenting the index also in Oslo. And I think that this is a wonderful occasion and I'm so glad to see the turnout that is here today. It says a lot about the interest for actually doing something different on measuring and having indexes that we haven't maybe done before. And we, all of us in this room, we know very well that when conflict is looming, women's rights and also women's security is often threatened a long time before one single gunshot is heard. And I spoke to this also um, this morning, or if it was last evening, I seem not to remember because there are so many things uh, happening at the same time. But, but the fact of the matter is that there is a close connection between state security and women's security, and we see it more and more often. And as tensions also rise, we also see another thing happening, and that is the abuse of women's rights. It increases. And we know all this, and still we haven't been able to do a lot about it. Hopefully, this index can be a change. Because we have very rarely monitored respect for women's rights and security with a view to preventing conflict. We often look at it in hindsight, but not for prevention measures. Repeatedly, we see that conflict will stop development in a country. And we can all understand that. I mean, it's, it's not very strange. It's not a finding that is very strange in any way. And this index is actually the first one to be built on the principles of the SDGs, which in itself is quite exciting. It encourages 
a holistic approach to both rights development and also security. And in my opinion, conflict prevention must be a key part of the strategy that we undertake for development and for the SDGs. And this index gives us a potential platform to integrated action. So as you will know shortly, the index has 11 indicators measuring aspects of women's lives, such as parliamentary representation, partner violence, and legal discrimination. These indicators tells us about threats to women, about access to justice, or in many cases, lack of access to justice. They tell us about opportunities. They tell us about obstacles to participation in all parts of society. Only one indicator measures organized violence and insecurity due to armed conflict. But yet 10 out of the 12 countries that rank lowest on the index are all on the Security Council's agenda. In areas of conflict, it is clear that women suffer on all levels, but it is hard, and it, at, least, at least it has been hard, to establish cause and effect precisely. At the same time, we know that women's contribution to development and prosperity, to resilience and to peace, suggests that gender equality is a key factor for both national and international security. When women do not have full access, which is the case in many countries and many regions, both to justice and to rights, they cannot be fully integrated into society. And this is a violation of human rights. But it's also an issue of security. And women's influence and participation is, as we all know, vital for building sustainable peace and resilient societies. And that is why Norway strive to include women in all our mediation, peacekeeping, peacebuilding efforts. But there is no other alternative either, because if we are to use or to achieve what we want by 2030, all our measures has to be gender equal. Otherwise, we will not get anywhere. So this index, again, as you soon will know, is the first to combine data on women's inclusion with data on justice and security. For too long, security and gender, experts on both sides have been doing a lot of good work. And they have been working in parallel, but not necessarily engaging with each other. So there is a real need to break down the silos. And I think all the good work that has been done in the respective silos now needs to be introduced to each other for the first time. So by putting this index together with data from other indices, we're gaining a more complete picture than we've had so far. We know that we need commitment from all key stakeholders. It is therefore encouraging, I think, that Security Council members, UN leaders, and individual countries have already acknowledged the index and have started to use the data. Wars and conflict worldwide, they take a huge toll on women's life. But women, peace and security is not merely a women's issue. And I spoke about this yesterday in this room, even though it was fire in the fireplace yesterday evening. I've been working with this agenda for nearly 10 years. I've seen some progress, but I've also seen some backlash. One of the points that I often make is that this agenda must not be a sideshow. It must be the main event. And making sure that this agenda is fully integrated into all efforts, into security policy, is actually not the responsibility of women alone. That is why I'm glad today as well to see men in the audience. Because one of the most important action points I tend to talk about is the need to engage men. Only then can we make a lasting change. And men are and should be 
vital agents of change. And they can be if we also put pressure on this side of the work. So this index provides vital knowledge on how women and men can work as effectively as possible to prevent conflict from happening. And we're pleased to have supported the first version of the index. We're looking forward to the continued cooperation on, uh, with Georgian Institute for Women, Peace and Security on the next index that's supposed to be launched in August next year. Hmm? At least now it's August next year. I don't, know if it, I don't know if it originally was August next year, but it was autumn next year, so I say August, that's fine. Um, I think this work is really very interesting and also something that adds new dimension to the work that we all want to see making progress in. So with those few words, I would like to say thank you for the attention. Um, and since I started out by saying that this is a roadshow, I would like, unless Sarah, of course, wants to come in the middle and, and give an introduction to Jenny, I would like to say to Jenny, take it away, because she's going to show you all the good things that this index entails. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to our colleagues at the uh, International Peace Institute for hosting this event today. I'm glad to see uh, there is standing room, or only that at that point. I'm thrilled to be here uh, together with the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Permanent Representative, and thanks very much to, to the great panel that we have assembled. My task here today in a relatively short period of time, so I'll speak quickly with an Australian accent, but hopefully you'll be able to follow me is to introduce this new index and that we developed jointly with Prio. I'm going to flag the main headlines, show you how it can be useful for your work and your advocacy, and hopefully have you all leave the room as uh, excited as we are and as new ambassadors uh, for the WPS index. So what I'm going to cover, um, and these are the broad headings, um, mirror the structure of the report. I'll motivate the index. Why new index? There are so many already. Why another one? Um, I'll lay out the key results, and then I'll take a deeper dive into the security dimension, which is a key innovation um, of this uh, new initiative. So let's begin with the first. Why a new index is needed. I think you'll all be aware that there are a growing number of global indices. Many of you would be familiar with the Human Development Index. Papa Sek and I worked on that at the Human Development Report Office, uh, with that published by the World Economic Forum every year. <clears throat> we reviews, reviewed all of these indices and realised that there was a major gap. As the Minister has already alluded to, the focus tra traditionally is on development aspects. So, for example, we looked to see whether girls are attending school. But surely that's incomplete if the girls are not safe in their own homes or if they're not safe in their communities on the way to school. <laughs> Likewise, if we look at traditional measures of security and peace, the measures, oh, the, the aspects of discrimination and systematic exclusion are almost invariably excluded. So no index before has brought together the dimensions of inclusion, justice and security together. And in that sense, I think it is truly a major innovation and has already been pointed out, it's also the first to take advantage of the new emerging consensus associated with the sustainable development agenda. And I'll show the ways in which we've linked to that agenda in the work that we've done. So what do we measure? Um, this slide th shows the three broad dimensions which are included, um, inclusion, justice and security. I'm not going to go into a lot of depth here, but you can see the broad structure. It's a multi-dimensional Index inclusion has multiple index. We cover social, economic, as well as uh, political aspects. Justice we capture in terms of both formal laws or discrimination, as well as informal, what we call informal justice, um, with respect to discrimination, as well as bias um, against girls. And security is measured at three levels, at the household, community, and societal level. And I'll go into that in a bit more depth later on. Of course, even once we've agreed on a conceptual framework and a more comprehensive approach, we still need to choose which indicators we're going to use. How are we actually going to measure this? Here, we did have the advantage of coming on the heels of the sustainable development agenda. And so we made a deliberate attempt to link each of the um, aspects in which we we're interested to targets and indicators which are already agreed as part of that framework. We're not inventing new measures, we're using those which around which there's an emerging consensus. The slide here, which is also available on page 14 of the report, um, shows how we did that. We still needed criteria to um, govern the selection of indicators. Those of you who are familiar with the SDG Goal 5, for example, would know that there are 50 
indicators under that. So we didn't want to include all 50 in this particular index. So we still needed um, some criteria there to govern our choices. And an important one was data availability. We didn't want to have to impute or kind of um, assume data uh, for too many countries. Uh, and we wanted to have obviously good quality as well as public availability of the data. They're not, um, it's not data that we're collecting ourselves, it's data that we're taking from existing international databases. So let me cut to the chase um, and uh, show you what we've, we found. And the Minister has already given you a sense of that uh, with the bottom dozen. So this is the top and bottom dozen as they emerge um, from our rankings. We rank 153 countries covering more than 98% of the world's population. Um, Syria and Afghanistan come in in last place, and you can see those um, uh, in the bottom dozen here. Iceland uh, um, pips Norway at the post for the uh, for the top spot here. Um, so this graph here, which is also taken uh, from the report, shows the, the 153 countries, obviously you can't read the names, has they group into tercels. So that's one of the devices that we use in the report, just broadly speaking, splitting the countries into thirds and seeing how... Um, uh, how, how they rank. You can find the countries as well in alphabetical order on the inside cover of the um, report. But I think it's more interesting than the aggregate results is actually to look behind the results and to see what the indicators show, what the stories are there. And so, for example, if we look here across different country groupings, and here we have various regions. I won't go into the details here. I don't have time. Um, as well as developed countries and fragile states. <clears throat> and you can see their average performance in the grey bar, but you can also three across these three dimensions, there's actual substantial unevenness in performance. So only about 30 countries fall into the top third of performance for all three dimensions. There's actually quite a lot of variation um, in terms of performance. And we can see this as well when we look across regions, patterns of achievement across regions. So overall, developed regions Oh, develop, the group of developed country does the best. Um, and um, overall, the Middle East and North Africa um, does relatively poorly, as do the fragile states group. But I think the important point to take away from here is that there are countries in each region, and here I've just listed the top country. In most regions, there's several um, that perform better than the global average. So we don't need to look to Iceland or Norway to see good performers. Um, in sub-Saharan Africa, we can look to Namibia, South Africa, Mauritius, Ghana and Tanzania, all perform above the global average. If we look at Latin America, Jamaica, Costa Rica, Argentina, Chile and Brazil, all perform above the global average. So looking at the feasibility of improvement as illustrated by the achievements of neighbours is one of the themes that we develop in the report. And this is for the overall index, and we can also see that across the various indicators, including education, um, access to finance and other aspects. Uh, a related theme that we look at in the report, and this again is echoing a theme that's been explored from the outset in the human development reports, is that money matters, but it's not the whole story. And there are a number of countries that do either much better or much worse than what their per capita income ranking shows. And here we show the countries which move the largest number of places. The red ones dropping large numbers of places. Uh, Saudi Arabia drops nearly uh, 90 places. Um, and then we compare that to the countries that do relatively better than their um, per capita income ranking. Of course, behind these numbers, there are very complex uh, context-specific uh, stories. We have country spotlights in the report which try and investigate um, and explain trends over time, patterns over time, what's been driving change. There are countries where performance has been quite uneven, including this one, the US, um, South Africa, Sri Lanka and others, countries of progress, uh, as well as countries facing a risk of reversal. So what we would like to do is to kind of use the index as the opening for, if you like, a conversation to have deeper investigations into, into what's happening. Just to give you a bit of a flavour about what, we, what you can do with the indicators and actually what we have available on the website, which I'd encourage you to visit, is the example of the US, and then I'll also show the example of Pakistan. So the US ranks 22nd overall. Um, it's 13 places below its ranking on income per capita. It does actually quite well on the inclusion and justice dimensions, at least those that we measure. Um, it, the key weakness is actually intimate partner violence. And so we have these graphs on the website where you can see um, that the US's um, 
estimated rate of lifetime intimate partner violence is some 37% uh, compared to the neighbouring Canada, where it's only 6%. So you can see their comparisons to countries in the region. Um, here, the case of Pakistan, which is actually in the bottom dozen, fairly close uh, to the bottom, uh, 150th rank. It's also significantly below its income rank, some 36 places below the income rank, especially weak on inclusion and also very weak on justice. And here I've just illustrated financial inclusion. Uh, only 3% of women um, have access to financial services. Um, only fewer than one in four women are working. And the rate of discriminatory norms, and the measure we have there is whether or not you think it's okay for women to work if they want to, um, three in four Pakistani men disagree uh, with that proposition. So just quickly on um, security, as I mentioned, we tackle this at three levels. Um, Organised violence and societal levels of insecurity are clearly important, but of direct relevance, more direct relevance for many women around the world in at least a larger number of countries is insecurity at the community as well as at the family level. I think you'd all know that um, uh, intimate partner violence is the most common form of violence experienced by women globally, but with significant variation across countries. And I won't go into the details here. I'm sure there have been multiple sessions during CSW on this topic. We also make the point that intimate partner violence is typically also worse in conflict settings. So there's a relationship there uh, between the two. We look at uh, community violence um, or community safety, and this is a perception of whether or not you feel safe walking in your neighbourhood at night. And actually, Australia, together with Saudi Arabia, has the largest gender gap on this particular indicator. And just to flag here, um, the correlation between the sense of lack of safety um, in the community being associated with lack of um, security in the home. So if, if you live in a country where you're more likely to experience violence at home, you're actually more likely to also feel unsafe in the community, which is, I think, um, possibly not very surprising, but I think very depressing uh, finding as well. And then finally, with respect to organised violence, this obviously draws on um, a lot of good work which has been done um, at Uppsala and elsewhere. So we use this uh, widely um, cited index of battle deaths. It's not a perfect measure in the sense that it's not gender disaggregated. Um, it misses aspects of conflict which we know are particularly serious for women. So, for example, we know that maternal mortality tends to go up in the context of conflict. At the same time, we feel that omitting this aspect would be missing an important part of the story. Um, and this just gives you a sense here of um, what the overall patterns are in terms of changes over time. Um, the, the blue part of the bar here is state-based conflict. Um, the the organised violence measure has the advantage, though, that it also captures non-state as well as one-sided um, conflict. So as the, as the minister mentioned, um, we're very happy uh, to be in a position where we're able to continue work. Um, we really feel like we've only scratched the surface so far. Um, I think it would be possible to undertake quite interesting explorations at the country level, for example, um, develop toolkits or um, uh, kind of facilities which are useful for advocates who want to kind of utilise the information. Uh, we plan to fully update uh, the rankings um, and the measures in time. Well, I'm, I had fall still here. <laughs> you mind you're having fall, it's not autumn, it's uh, <clears throat> next year, the second half of next year. Uh, um, I think we promised in advance of the high level political forum, so I guess that will determine to some extent the dates and the 20th anniversary. Um, of the 1325 resolution in 2020. But we do very much hope that this index will be useful for you. We would like you to explore it, to critique it, to give us feedback and work out ways in which you can help advance our shared agenda for women, peace and security. Thank you. Okay, hello again <laughs> from my new perch. Um, so as noted, um, we've already heard from Dr. Klickman, who is the Managing Director of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. Um, she, in addition to this role, she is also a fellow at the Kennedy School of Government's Women in Public Policy program at Harvard University, um, and is uh, leading on an, I, I have many things in your bio. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get to all of them. Um, uh, but she's also been Director of Gender and Development at the World Bank, Director and Lead Author of three Global Human Development Reports published by UNDP, um, and we're really delighted that she's here for the conversation today. 
Um, we are also joined by Papa Sek, um, who is the chief statistician at UN Women. Since joining UN Women in 2009, he has led statistics and data work at UN Women and has also contributed to the research work of the institution more generally. Um, He's co-authored two editions of Progress of the World's Women, leads UN Women's efforts to monitor the SDGs, um, and for the, la for the past year has coordinated the UN system's efforts to ensure the inclusion of strong gender indicators in the SDGs. So we're absolutely delighted that you're here with us. Um, and then, of course, we have Lina Abu Habib, who is the Executive Director of Women's Learning Partnership a nonprofit international women's rights organization dedicated to supporting women in the global south to become leaders and advocates for a just, equitable, and peaceful world in which women's human rights are realized and protected, which I think is an agenda that we can all get behind. Um, she is a co-founder and coordinator of the um, Maghreb, I'm not going to, I'm going to Okay. Um, uh, Maghreb Gender Linking and Information Project. Um, she has collaborated with a number of regional and international agencies, public institutions, and uh, mainstreaming gender into development policies and practices. She's a former chair of the board of the Association for Women's Rights and Development, and is currently a MENA advisor for the Global Fund for Women and on the editorial board of Oxfam's journal, Gender and Development. And I think that's just about enough for me. I think we can get going to... The next discussion, which will be the next question that will be addressed by one of our panelists, will be by Papa Sek. So we gave the panelists a, some sort of discussion points to address. And so um, if you don't mind, I will frame your response by saying we asked Papa Sek to look into um, some of the constraints on collecting data in fragile and conflict contexts and how insights from women, peace, and security indicators and tools like the index can inform you and women's work. Thank you. Perfect. Great. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, before starting, I just wanted to correct Jenny a little bit. She said that we worked together at the Human Development Report Office. No, she was the director. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> working together, but. <laughs> Anyways, it's really a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for, for inviting me. Now we're working me. together. Exactly, <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, 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 again, I, uh, at UN Women, I think this is really a core of our work. Uh, uh, the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda is really central to everything that we do. And, uh, and you know, as the conclusions of the global study in 2016 made clear, uh, the peace and Women, Peace, and Security Agenda is still a work in progress, and much efforts are needed for on the on, on the part of all actors to really make it a reality. And um, the adoption of the SDGs also, and particularly Goal 16, I think, uh, uh, have put a renewed emphasis on this agenda. And one of the reasons, and here we, you know, I'll talk more to the to the data side of things to address the question, is that uh, the what the little bit of data that we currently have tell us is that um, on nearly all development outcomes uh, uh, and uh, uh, basically countries in conflict situations has have much much lower levels of achievements uh, and uh, if we are really talking about a no one left behind type of agenda this is really i think critical for us to to focus on uh, our efforts on, on getting more information and addressing the issues of data availability in conflict and post-conflict situations head on um, so again, data is a key roadblock, and just recently, uh, as recent as last month, we uh, at UN Women published its first gender and SDG monitoring report, and um, uh, the report is called "Turning Promises into Action," and we look at I think lots of relevant issues, and one of them being data. And just to give you the scale of the challenge that we have, uh, currently only 10 out of the 54 gender-specific indicators in the SDGs can be reliably monitored. Um, and um, uh, uh, basically for 25 of those indicators, we do have accepted international, internationally accepted methodologies for measurement, but the data are really patchy 
and uh, not often uh, produced by, by countries. And for 18 of those indicators, in fact, we do not have accepted methodologies at all, so meaning that we don't know, know how to measure them yet. And um, uh, the timeliness is also a key concern. Um, uh, uh, only 24%, so a quarter of the data that we currently have is from 2010 or, uh, or, 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 or 2000, between 2010 and now. So just essentially, I mean, let's think about conflict situations where basically the data that we have are pro probably from even before 2010. Really, what do we, what do we, I think, what kind of information are we really getting? Um, and, you know, again, this is why, why it matters for, uh, data really matters for, for the Women, Peace and Security agenda. All of the markers of data availability are worse in conflict and post-conflict situations, just as, as development outcomes are worse. And for obvious reasons, because this is, it's related to data collection requires security, the security of those who are collecting the data on the ground. Uh, the issue of, of lack of resources, uh, weak institutions, including national statistical systems. And uh, uh, so, you know, having data from accurate data, adequate data from these countries is notoriously difficult. Just to give you an example of Mali, where uh, due to conflict, uh, due to a conflict situation in particular areas, a survey from the World Bank that is funded, and that would have provided quite a lot of useful information on, on the situation of women, has had to be postponed for several years now, just because it is not safe to actually go and collect the data. Um, uh, and um, but also, I think we we uh, just thinking about the SDGs and uh, you know the process of negotiating them. We know that um, SDG 16 could have been better when it comes to integrating a women, peace, and security agenda. And uh, just uh, um, uh, this week, there was an article in uh, Open Democracy by Professor Anne Marie Gertz from uh, from NYU, which uh, who who made the case quite clearly how on basically how uh, uh, the WPS agenda could have been could have been stronger in SDG 16. So I think uh, uh, one other problem that we have when it comes to reporting on 1325, for instance, is that countries do not necessarily um, feel that they have ownership over the, the indicators. So they do not always report on the data. And uh, all the more, uh, Important, I think, to, to, to uh, I think this index really is, is critical in that sense. It gives us, I think, the tools that are necessary to, to uh, show countries where they are and uh, to deepen our advocacy. But also, I think, for UN women in particular, it complements our work on particularly on process-related indicators. So issues around, you know, uh, women's participation in peace processes, uh, issues around uh, measuring national action plans and how they integrate gender equality. And also, you know, frankly, you know, uh, uh, trying to get to uh, a, a hot button issue, which is the funding for the uh, women, peace and security agenda. And all of those things are really, I think, important. And this, this index for us, I think, is really critical in terms of helping us to make the case. And uh, just finally, to conclude, I think, I've highlighted the challenges, but I think you know the, the, this moment in time also gives us an opportunity to really strengthen data systems. Uh, when we talk about a data revolution, I think you know uh, the whole global community is behind it. We just need to make sure that as we uh, deepen our efforts to address statistical challenges, that we put a, put 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 a premium on addressing them in uh, conflict and post-conflict situations. Thank you. Thank you, so, yes. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the discussion that we're gonna have amongst the panelists um, right after we hear from you, Lena. So uh, we asked Lena to uh, address a, a few key questions from her perspective, um, which is how do women's groups uh, at the community level and the grassroots level access and use data in their advocacy? Um, how could a tool like the index be useful and helpful in that work? And the, what should the role be of women's civil society groups in designing metrics, indicators, and collecting data? Thank you, Sarah. Um, 
Thank you for uh, having us, Women's Learning Partnership, in this. Um, uh, let me start by saying that I've, and I've just, uh, like I shared with Jenny, um, we've read the, uh, the report, uh, re you know, uh, not so long ago, and I was truly impressed. I, I myself am not a quantoid, so I don't feel comfortable with, uh, with uh, hard figures. Uh, but I read it in conjunction with what we do on the ground. I read it in conjunction with what the Women's Learning Partnership uh, does actually in 20 countries on women, peace, and security. Not in all of these 20 countries, but as you know, we work in context. Uh, our work is in the global south in a context where countries are either in a conflict, preparing to get into a conflict, barely getting out of conflict, or in some unfortunate transition. Uh, and what does it mean? What does this work mean for us? How can it be useful for us? That is the thought process that went into uh, uh, responding to your question. I want to start by the issue of, uh, okay, in this context, how do we deal with uh, data, with reliable uh, data? And um, I'll, cha I'll start with challenges, but I'll end on a positive note. Um, <laughs> Similarly, as uh, uh, Jennifer uh, uh, described, and I was, and, and as our colleague from UN Women said, we do have in uh, most countries of the global south, let's say, a problem with actually first at the level of access, accessing data, mm -hmm. because um, let me just qualify the situation by being not incredibly transparent, uh, <coughs> not really. Uh, so particularly for civil society wanting to access serious, uh, serious data. Uh, uh, the, the other thing is um, collecting data in any case on issues related to women's rights is not given priority, is not given resources most of the time. So that is another, another challenge. And I have to say, in most of our countries where we work, there is by default a mistrust in official data. Um, we we'll, I think we need to be very honest uh, about this. Uh, I was struck by something that our colleague from UN Women said, which is that data collection requires safety. And that is absolutely true. That, that is, that is a, um, an important variable that makes data collection, uh, but especially this kind of data, very difficult. But it also needs skills, and it also needs a framework where data collection is allowed mm -hmm. in one major country in our region, which I shall not name, it's illegal to collect data. So uh, it's illegal to do any form of uh, uh, research. It's illegal to go to the field and ask people questions. So that is also uh, uh, problematic for us. However, because of these challenges on the one hand, and because it's so important to be part of this monitoring, this collection of data, I think, um, and that is something that, that, that we discussed again at the very practical level of our work with women in these countries. I think it's very feasible for us in, within, within the framework of our work, within the framework of communities we work with, women we work with, women we train, women we engage with in advocacy, uh, one of the practical things that we can, and this addresses your second question, one of the practical things that we can start doing, and which we're already doing in one way or the other, but I really like the, uh, I really like the framework that Jennifer has presented, is actually built this in as part of our work. Um, we can't cover countries, we can't do national uh, data collection, but we can actually, with people with whom we work, we can very easily, uh, we, uh, and let me talk to you from a perspective of an organization that works on rights, that an organization that is feminist, that is, uh, seeks to empower women. Uh, our suggestion would be for us and for all of us to make this a practice, to, uh, to make data collection empowering for women. Uh, to make it in a way that, as part of a workshop, as part of a conversation with the with the with the community. Um, the other thing, uh, it was your question, the, the question about how to how to how to use this data. I think advocacy is the most important thing. Um, 
in terms of the purpose, or what is it that we could immediately use this data for? Mm -hmm. I, as we said when we were listening to the presentation, um, I feel really bad that most of the poor countries come from my region. I mean, um, hopefully in two years. Uh, <laughs> but, um, um, but I think, um, what do we do in advocacy ourselves as Women Learning Partnership? We, there are instruments that we use, there are instruments that we monitor, that there are instruments that are very precious for us. Mm -hmm. CEDO, the CSW, the UPR. But all of these instruments, as important as they are, number one, they are non-binding, and number two, uh, uh, measuring progress is incredibly subjective. The way we write shadow reports on uh, what achievements we, shadow reports from a, from CSO perspective um, is, is still quite an amateurish. Uh, uh, we, we still do it in quite an amateurish way, and I think these uh, this index is a very um, is very powerful at two levels. First, to hold governments accountable, which means, and I'm not just saying it as a slogan. It means that women have to know about it. Women. Uh, women have to know that this is how bad their country is doing and why are they at the bottom of the heap because of such policies, because of these decisions which have these consequences. So there is that one, one thing that, 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 uh, um, that, that we can do. And secondly, is actually creating a momentum which I see it's really possible uh, uh, from the relationship that we have with women with whom we work, where actually you can be part of that process that collects information mm -hmm. that can be used to hold your country accountable uh, uh, on a number, I mean, on everything that you have described. Mm -hmm. the, the last thing I want to conclude with is, again, um, again, I'm not a, 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 uh, I'm, I'm not a quantoid, but I found the uh, aggregate uh, nature of the, uh, uh, of the index and the way in which things were th huge uh, uh, concepts were put together and then broken down into very specific indicators. I mean, that that that's that's really helpful for us. And um, I also liked now that is the conclusion. The, the first point was not the conclusion. I really, um, I really uh, like what what you're proposing in terms of the way ahead. Country level thematic exploration is exactly what I'm talking about in terms of bringing this down at the level of what are we doing on the ground. Toolkits for advocates is actually what will help us work with women so that they become advocates on it. And then the update in two years, three years, four years, but, <laughs> I, but as long as we haven't. As long as we haven't. Uh, I hope you will not do like the uh, Republic of Lebanon, which had a one and only census in 1933. <laughs> so since then, we don't have, we've never had a population census. So two years, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, I think what we've touched on here are. Um, Minister. Um, what you've touched on here is really crucial as we're exploring both um, the development of the index, of the information that it draws on, but also the utility of the index, you've hit on the point. There's a reason that data collection is political, and it's because properly collected data has the power to expose rights violations, to point to changes that need to be made. And so I think that really speaks to the power of the project, particularly in the Women, Peace, and Security agenda, close to my heart. Um, but that's a really crucial point. Um, I, I have a couple of questions that I would just love to ask if we'll sort of take around five or ten minutes just to have a little bit of discussion amongst ourselves. What I thought is I might raise one or two issues that have come up mm -hmm. and you can address them as, as you wish. Um, one which uh, Jenny might want to address is getting back to this issue of data collection, um, getting back to how the information is collected and what information is collected. You know, the minister had raised the point that uh, one of the indicators is related to 
conflict specifically. And yet there seems to be a very good reflection in the results of the index that sort of show where it's, um, that, that's indicating uh, which countries are in fact, you know, on the council's agenda, very, very deeply into conflict. So I'm just wondering if you can walk us through a little bit more about how you see some of the challenges with the data specific to women, peace and security and some of the comments that you've gotten and how mm -hmm. you're, you're seeing that being addressed in the actual results. Um, you know, uh, I, I think that one of the issues that you've touched on, one of the core issues that you've touched on is just where we need the data the most, is where the institutions are weakest, is where the funding is um, most challenging. Uh, there is this issue of politics of data collection, and as comfortable as you are speaking uh, for you and women on the po some of the politics that you encounter, <laughs> I'm very interested to hear in how um, you know, the politics of data collection are also how you navigate that in your work um, as an added layer. And then, uh, Lena, I think you raise a, a, a really important point, which is that um, civil society plays a crucial role in shadow reporting, in trying to get data and analysis and reporting, particularly on rights and even more particularly on women's rights, um, and that, you know, that shadow reporting is challenging. We are, many organizations, institutions, studies have demonstrated that we're in a particularly difficult time for funding for civil society organizations right now, particularly women's organizations. And I'm wondering if you could perhaps speak to some of the challenges uh, that lead to the sort of ad hoc nature of, of that shadow reporting. So those are just some of the things that I would love to hear. Um, as the panelists wish. Well, thanks, Sarah, and, and thanks very much to the panel. I think um, we've got a very rich agenda for discussion. Let me just respond briefly to the, the questions now which, which Sarah posed. On the security dimension, it's true that the, the bottom dozen are clearly those, um, mainly those who are affected currently by organised violence. Uh, but when we did sensitivity analysis and we took out that indicator from the index, um, the rankings actually don't change that much because it's the organised violence. Often, there's a couple of points to make, and I didn't make it explicitly in the um, in the presentation. Most countries are not affected by organised violence. We have 153 in our sample um, or in our, our data set. Um, 113 report zero for the entire period. But the other countries are typically affected by recurring conflict, and so it's not just that they've been in conflict between 2010 and 2015, which is the period we're looking at. It's that they've been subjected to recurring episodes over time. And that has wrought repercussions on women's employment, on women's access to finance, on women's um, uh, access to justice and so on. And so um, whilst it's not currently being reflected in the number of battle deaths necessarily, it is having these other longer term effects. So um, I think it's an important part of the story and I think to take that out would be missing an important part of the story, but it's not driving the results um, overall. So I think that's one important point to make. I think the other in terms of kind of the indicators and kind of the nature of the measure, I think kind of broadly speaking, the conceptual framework that we have in terms of the inclusion, justice and security has been warmly welcomed. Um, and it seems that that's a good way to proceed. Of course, to the extent that the, the underlying indicators can improve over time, um, that would be great um, and we would be able to correspondingly improve our measures. We haven't collected any data ourselves. We're drawing on the fabulous work that UN Women does, uh, that UNESCO <laughs> does, that the ILO does, um, Gallup World Poll data as well in order to be able to put this together. Um, but I think one aspect which I'd like to explore in particular, um, and maybe Lena we can talk about a partnership on this front, is thinking um, about the, the role of civil society and civil society mobilisation. Um, not necessarily to kind of quantify it and stick it inside the index, but to see how that's associated with achievements in terms of um, for countries over time. Because we, there has been some good work on that front, good academic work on that front, which shows that it is important. But I think kind of revisiting that issue and thinking about the ways in which um, uh, kind of measures of engagement and also measures of um, uh, kind of civil society autonomy and um, 
activism, if you like, um, and conversely, repression um, can affect achievements more broadly. So I think better measures on that front would be something that I would uh, particularly welcome or hope to get, if not in two years, in four years or, or six years. <laughs> thank you so much, Jenny. Papa? Uh, yes, thank you very much. So on the politics of data collection, I think this is something that we, we, we struggle with constantly. And, um, you know, just to give one example, there are, you know, there are still sensitivities around, for instance, collecting data on violence against women. So uh, this is, I think, still an issue that is very much, in some cases, at least, uh, you know, there's international recognitions of it, of it and everything. But once you start talking to uh, more conservative statistical offices and so on, it is really still seen as a ma private matter. And um, so, you know, those are, I think, challenges that we, we encounter all the time. And um, same is for, you know, collecting data on unpaid care and domestic work, for instance. And these are, again, it's a, uh, it's always a challenge. And the way we try to, uh, to, to address them and uh, uh, is really true, uh, advocacy, um, advocacy, cultivating demand. And really, I think, you know, for at the, at the national level in particular, uh, some of the work that we do is really working with institutions, working with statisticians themselves mm -hmm. so that we can, you know, bring them, basically bring gender into their world. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but at the same time, I think it's also uh, making sure that those that they are talking to, those who know uh, gender issues front and center, are also data literate. Mm. So really, I think, you know, it's bringing those two communities together to have a dialogue. And I think once you have start having that dialogue, then you can make progress on several, uh, and, uh, on these fronts. And, um, you know, again, and uh, to, to us, I think there's a, a, a key constituent is again, civil society. Uh, because uh, we know that civil society essentially, uh, collective action drives change. And uh, the way it drives change in policy, that's the same way it drives change in what data are collected. So, you know, again, and at the country level, we really try to foster that collaboration and bring them into the discussions that we are having with national statisticians and so on. Thank you very much. Yeah, as you can see, I'm frantically trying to take notes to keep up with what you're saying. So, um, Lena. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you for your question. Um, I was thinking about it, um, thinking about how to respond mm -hmm. uh, a little bit broadly in terms of um, shadow reporting as a process and what does it mean. Um, you're quite right. Uh, funding has become uh, more difficult, uh, more capricious, I have to say, um, more selective. And I think this is particularly felt at the level of small women's organizations. Um, and that's why we need to think about processes that are more global than small, wo small women's organization in terms of processes that, 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 that bring together, uh, 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 that are more all-encompassing geographically. Uh, the, the, so I'll just list challenges again. Um, and the other thing is um, the ways we are doing these uh, uh, the, these shadow reports, the skills required, and as I said, uh, and the process in which it happens. I have to say that, in in my view, and I may be wrong, but the, most of our partners, if not all of them, in the global south are engaged in some form of uh, shadow reporting or the other, being on CEDO, being on CRC, being on the UPR. Uh, everybody that does advocacy is, you know, engaged in shadow in shadow reporting. Um, however, the whole process, I think, of shadow reporting, um, please allow me to say, it's a little bit tokenistic. It's as mm -hmm. if, you know, uh, go ahead and do a shadow report and uh, ventilate your, your, <laughs> uh, uh, your anxiety. But what does it mean? What is it? First of all, how much are we investing in it? How much are we investing in building serious capacities for uh, 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 an enga a long-term engagement, not just in doing uh, s sequential shadow reports, but in being able to 
to, to actually bring out tools for advocacy from these shadow reports. A sh uh, you know, uh, again, I use the, the example of my, 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 my country because it's legitimate, I think. Um, Lebanon presents a shadow report uh, to the CEDAW Commission in Geneva or to the UPR. Uh, it gets re uh, reprimanded on some, the last UPR was something like 140 observation. Uh, and then the country, like any other country, invokes the specificity of the country and then why uh, specificity, specificity is only invoked on human rights and women's rights, by the way. Uh, and then it's, uh, uh, see, you, see you during the next round. Mm -hmm. But how do we make this an empowering tool for, um, uh, for global women organizations? Something that will be more that would require more skills something that would be more serious many of the shadow reports again i have to say they're a little bit am amateurish so uh which bring me to my la to my to my uh um to my last uh, point to my last recommendation and building on what the uh, um the minister her excellency said there are silos and i i totally agree this index breaks silos and brings everything together. I think there are other silos that we need to, uh, to, to that, that, that we need to uh, 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 overcome. Um, all these mechanisms are separated. How can such an index become a tool that will help us actually bring together all these, un all these other mechanisms that we're using for advocacy for women's rights, that we're using for our work. How can it be useful for our work on CEDAW uh, monitoring? How can it be used on our work for UPR monitoring? Because otherwise, uh, again, from a, uh, uh, from a civil society perspective, um, do you know how many reports are being yeah. written yeah. Um, uh, for the... That, I think that should be our next, uh, our next, uh, our next question. I hope I responded to your yes, of course. question. Thank you. Yes, that was perfect. Um, and I think a really great moment to open up to questions from the floor. Um, so I'll take three questions at the beginning, and I've got, I've actually got two there, um, and one here, and then we'll do another round. So I've got two, yes, two, you, and then there's somebody right behind you as well. Yes, so. uh, thank you. Oh, yes, if you could say um, your name and your affiliation, and I, I implore you as the moderator to keep your comments and interventions brief. Yes. Thank you. My name is Soraida Abd Hussain. I'm from the Women's Affairs Technical Committee, Palestine. Mm -hmm. My question is, what was the uh, criteria to choose the countries, uh, knowing that uh, Palestine has the Palestinian Bureau of Statistics, and we have gender uh, classified uh, reports every year. So we have good data to be used. Mm. I was surprised we were not mentioned here. So what was the criteria? Perfect. Hi. Um, my name is Aline Vogt. I'm with the Gender, Peace, and Security Unit in DPA. Um, and my question is a bit more about thinking outside the box. So um, I really appreciate it was was said in the beginning about engaging men um, on these is on these issues. Um, but I also think men shouldn't be engaged only on the women peace and security aspect, but also on the more broader gender peace and security aspect. So like thinking about masculinities and violence. So for instance, if I look at Switzerland, which ranks quite high um, in the index and which is where I'm from. Um, there, we also um, have quite strict conscription laws, which only apply to men. So I just wondered if you think that this is a possible issue to address in the future, masculinity, violence, um, and if there is room to think about that. And then I had one here. Hi, thank you. Nina Lahoud with the UN many years, and I'm a board member with the International Legal Assistance Consortium. Uh, thanks very much. Great job, Jenny. And I wanted to focus on the issue uh, uh, raised, uh, elaborated on by Mr. Sek. And, and Jenny, you mentioned that this incredible index uh, doesn't go to the source uh, national statistics. It relies on international reports and all. And Mr. Sek has indicated that that's a challenge. And we know from the MDG framework, the lack of data capacity, much less sex, sexual disaggregated data, is a problem. 
And in the global study for implementation in, of uh, 1325, there's 10 pages on the issue of uh, national statistics and available national statistics. And the recommendations were that donors focus more on technical and financial assistance to help countries build their statistical capacity. And uh, also for the national governments themselves to allocate more resources in that direction. Um, and so I wanted to ask, um, while you've mentioned that the security is one issue that some conflict-affected countries have shied away, I, I work a lot with the G7 plus group of 20 fragile and conflict-affected countries, and most recently with the justice ministers at a meeting this summer, and they truly have an issue with human resource capacity, building capacity to gather statistics, institutions, statistical commissions, planning commissions, et cetera. So I want to ask, all of that is to ask, what has, you know, from the UN uh, Statistical Commission to agencies, to member states, what have they done with the recommendations to focus on this area as a mainstay of, of international assistance? And, and that, in fact, drives their agenda on the ground, the needs of women and, and uh, you know, what they allocate their budgets for. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Nina. And then uh, just before I come back to the panelists, um, I believe we have, via social media, um, we have a question from somebody who's watching this on Facebook. Hi, thanks everyone, and I encourage you to take a look on, oh, hold on. <laughs> so my apologies as we just wait for the message from the emergency system within the building. My apologies. <laughs> Normally they come on with a message about what's actually going on, so. Um. We could try to speak. Yeah, over okay, this. I'm gonna, so just gonna let's read it. do that. So, yes, yeah, I, um, I encourage you all to take a look on uh, Facebook Live. We've received comments from Pakistan, Somalia, and Indonesia. Uh, this question comes to us from Chipogu, a gender and development specialist from Nigeria. And she asks How can we ensure the safety of non state key informant actors in a state influenced conflict situation? Thank you. Well, I think that uh, that message is reassuring, so that's good. Speaking of safety and security, and I think I'm, I'm so glad that we're getting that, uh, that that question. Thank you, Hillary, because I think it's a crucial one. If it's all right with all of you, I'm just going to keep going. So. <laughs> and on that note, um, I'm going to return to, uh, to the panelists for responses to the questions from the floor. Great. Thanks very much for, for excellent questions. I'll, I'll try and speak over, because um, I think otherwise we, we might run out of time. Um, so our basic criteria for inclusion of a country was that they had data available for at least eight of the 11 indicators from the sources that we were using. Um, so I imagine the issue with respect to um, occupied uh, Palestinian territories was not meeting that criteria, but I can check further and, um, and uh, work out which particular ones were missing. Um, on Switzerland, I was actually presenting last week in Vienna at the OSCE, and there was a Swiss colleague there who also expressed surprise at uh, Switzerland's ranking. Um, so obviously it's a reflection of how they did on the indicators that we've included and doesn't include other aspects, you know, which we may regard um, as being important. So I think the way to think about kind of particular issues or aspects which are important for 
either one or more countries, is to think about, well, how can we use this framework and complement it you know, with specific aspects which are relevant here? Because I think it's, it's very easy to overload an index by putting lots and lots of things inside, but then it becomes less and less evident what it's actually telling you. So I think that the simplicity is a virtue, but the simplicity also means that we're inevitably excluding aspects which, which are important in any particular country. So I would encourage you to kind of look at, you know, complementing what we have with, with those aspects. And I think the, the questions that were raised on the capacity side and also by the, the colleague on, on Facebook Live were very important, but I think my fellow panellists are better placed to uh, respond to those ones. Yeah, uh, so on the statistical capacity side of things, and uh, I think there were some uh, uh, some specific recommendations, in, as you mentioned, in, uh, in the global study. and. Uh, and I have to admit that I think it's still a work in progress. So uh, when it comes to uh, the resources uh, that are devoted to statistical capacity, they're not nearly enough. And just to give you, when we talk about gender, it's even worse. Mm -hmm. It has improved in recent years. So, but then, you know, uh, I think in, uh, uh, for the latest data that we have, so in 2014, ODA to uh, a project addressing gender equality as a principal objective in terms of statistical capacity were amounted to, to about $2.5 million globally, which is basically enough to conduct two violence against women surveys, right? So uh, clearly, I think we, we have a lot of ways to go when it comes to the funding that is necessary. And um, you know, again, uh, with a new program that we have, uh, I think such funding has been in improving, but it is not nearly where we, we want to be. But I think if we are talking about conflict situations, I think it also uh, extends to even the institutions themselves. So uh, you know, in a lot of uh, uh, countries now, what we have is that we have decent national statistical offices. The broader system is usually poor, but uh, gender statisticians, gender specialists in national statistical offices are nowhere to be found. So, and I think, I mean, it's basically an issue with, and in, in, in conflict situations, I think we have a, con a conflation of all of those issues. So it is really a challenge. Something that we have to address, we, we are addressing in a, what do you call it, uh, progressively, but I think, you know, I totally agree with you that it is really not something that is prioritized as far as I know so far, and more efforts need to be put, in, uh, put into that. And I think uh, really the global community has to, uh, you know, bring this up to the statistical commission. Exactly. So and I think it has to be a collective effort. So it is not, I think, up to one organization or one agency. It has to be a collective effort. Just quickly, um, um, actually one of the questions inspired me. Uh, um, and uh, just want to point out, I was happy that our colleague from, this is our colleague from Nigeria mm -hmm. who, uh, who reached out, which is really great. But one of the questions inspired me just to reflect about something, and maybe it's a conversation that we can have later, uh, maybe with, uh, with, with you, with Jennifer. But um, how will we be able to gather uh, good data where we could construct women peace and security indices related to refugees and people in transitions, because mm -hmm. that's even more complex and more complicated. And this is a large number of women who are under nobody's mandate uh, or security or whatever. I think that's a conversation. And I'm bringing it up because that's that has become a, a more and more prominent aspect of our work as Women's Learning Partnership for obvious reasons. Um, and we would certainly want to reflect on how can we make sure uh, that we understand better through your index what kind of what kind of data collection is needed. Thank you. I'm going to take moderator's privilege <laughs> and um, just throw to Jenny one more time and and maybe you know that kind of issue, which is sort of core to the woman peace and security issue, is two things. One, you know, how have you thought about addressing that issue around you know displacement refugees, populations that aren't captured, or do you find that it is that you know sort of emerges in the current index in some way? I'm I'm, I'm interested in how you're you've been you've grappled with this issue. 
I mean, frankly, so far, not very much. Um, so I think it is an important issue. It's obviously more important in some places than in others. Um, but you could imagine um, doing really some quite insightful work, and not only in uh, the MENA region, but also in other parts of the world, um, and comparing outcomes or comparing achievements for different groups in the population, um, depending on um, kind of citizenship status, if you like, or um, uh, whether or not they've been displaced. So I think it's a great idea. Um, I mean, Papa probably knows better. I think it varies a bit across countries, the extent to which people are included um, in statistics. So for example, you know, whether or not the mean years of schooling number includes refugee populations um, for, um, you know, in the case of Lebanon, for example, I don't know. Um, but uh, my understanding is that it varies a bit across countries. Um, in terms of how um, non-citizens are treated in terms of the, the national statistics. Is that right, Papa? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it depends on really, I think, on the laws uh, uh, governing statistical production. So in some cases, refugees are probably, uh, for instance, not counted as part of the census. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I think uh, one possibility here may be to start working with UN, uh, uh, UNHCR. Mm -hmm. And because they do collect quite a lot of data on, on displacement and, and so on. And uh, increasingly, I think that data is also being disaggregated by sex and so on. So I think it would be good to, to reach out to UNSCR and see how, even if it is as, a, you know, as an addendum to, to, to the index, those issues could be addressed. Thank you. I'll stop abusing my position up here now and throw to a question here, a question here, and then I have a question here. Yes? Thank you very much for the presentation. My name is Rachel Grimes. I work in the Office of Military Affairs. I'm not a quantoid, but I conceive a value in this um, booklet for trying to create a narrative with troop contributing countries who do or don't deploy women to peacekeeping. So I think my question is more for Jenny, but maybe the panel would take it. Um, did you find when you were accumulating this data any correlation between how many women are working in the security sector, like the military or the police, and how safe the population felt uh, in linking to how many women were represented? Mm, mm, mm. Thank you very much, uh, Michal Minar, Ambassador of Slovakia. Thanks very much for uh, really this useful and uh, uh, and thought-provoking uh, uh, panel and, and the discussion. Uh, following up on, um, on what uh, uh, my colleague from the OMA has just said, uh, I was uh, about to also focus on the issue of uh, gender, women's participation in the security sector, and uh, we very much uh, look at it as a governance issue. Uh, of course, it is uh, closely linked to uh, SDG 16, but it goes beyond that. Uh, and I, um, I wanted to say that, uh, in fact, uh, so far, uh, of course, we see that uh, it is a bit easier in the police sector or uh, with the police uh, forces. But of course, it's much more challenging with the, um, uh, with the military uh, and with the armed forces. Uh, and uh, it's important to talk about uh, uh, these issues, of course, both from the uh, uh, from the data perspective, but uh, but beyond that. Uh, and um, we are working together with South Africa and Colombia, uh, and uh, uh, preparing an event. Uh, uh, which will be held probably later in in June, which will focus specifically on um, uh, on the issue of gender uh, as a from the governance pers perspective in the security sector. So we will certainly uh, then um, uh, uh, coordinate with uh, uh, with other interested uh, uh, organizations, and uh, hopefully it will be a, a useful contribution also to to this particular debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then I had one question. Yes. Uh, well, thank you so much for this extraordinary uh, report. Uh, I'm Manas Afkami, also from WLP. Uh, I just wanted to say that it's so um, uh, significant and useful that the conversation on women, peace, and security has expanded from its origins of including women at the peace table, and it has become much more comprehensive, including human development, human rights, and, and uh, as, as a presupposition for, for peace and security. Uh, and uh, I see that there is a great deal of interest uh, in, in the fact that uh, advocacy in support of the work that is being done in knowledge building uh, 
uh, and knowledge gathering uh, is, is, is uh, very important to the process. So in order to expand this, that is the conversation between the non-governmental organizations, the uh, academic circles and so forth, could we possibly begin expanding the terminology uh, to human security? Uh, because that's what right now, for instance, our partnership is working on in 50 countries, trying to use that language, that is the intersection between human rights and human development, as a, a presupposition or pre precondition for peace, so that we're all speaking more or less in language that is understandable for you know, the grassroots as well as the masses of women around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will turn once more to my colleagues at the table to address the issues. Um, well, thanks very much for the suggestion. We're getting lots of good ideas here on, uh, on further work we need to do. And we haven't um, looked specifically at those correlations between women's representation in the security sector and community safety, for example, or indeed the aggregate outcomes or the aggregate rankings that we have in terms of the index. So I think looking at that overall, then specific aspects like police and other um, um, uh, angles uh, could be really quite interesting, conditional on data being available. So we could even have a relatively quick look at that and to see what it shows. I'm happy to uh, to share share those results. Um, and I was very happy to get your reflections. Um, I mean, frankly, I'm relatively new into this arena. I came more from a kind of development background. Um, the Women, Peace and Security agenda clearly has kind of its origins in, well, the women's movement in 1325 and so on. Um, uh, coming, if you like, from the Human Development Report where, you know, there was discussions about human security already for many years. Um, one can see that the terminology sometimes can reinforce these silos. So I guess the question is how to kind of get beyond those. So I guess, you know, with our index, it's called a WPS index, but when you look and see what's inside, it's inclusion, just security. So we kind of, kind of came around um, that way. So I guess... Until there's agreement on language, um, which may be some time away, I think it's it's important to be thinking about the substance and you know and how we can be working together and moving things forward and not getting too hung up on um, nomenclature because I think sometimes that can um, that can hold back uh, hold back the progress. But that's I guess that's the off the record on the record <laughs> comments from me. <laughs> um, I'll, I'm just going to jump in on that point as well um, because yeah I think that for to a certain degree, the woman peace and security nomenclature is sort of held hostage to its own history. Um, it, that is the name of the official agenda across the street at the UN Security Council, that's been the origins. Um, I think there are sort of two questions to raise as we think about that, not just when we're talking about human security, but also talking about gender peace and security, is that um, we need to make sure not only that men are involved in the women, peace, and security agenda, but also that we are capturing um, the full gamut of the ways that people experience particular types of violations and violence and exclusion because of their gender. And that's gender writ large. That's not solely about women. I think when we talk about women, peace, and security, the added advantage there is that it allows us to focus on, particularly when we're talking about uh, women's rights, violations of women's rights, that it gives us a sort of specificity on that. But it is absolutely not um, settled territory. Um, it is contested territory because words do matter, just like data matters. Um, and, uh, and I think it will continue to be a really an important discussion. Uh, oh, and would you like to? Yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, on the first question, uh, uh, I think, um, if I recall, perhaps um, when we were doing uh, our, uh, working on our report on women's access to justice back in 2011, I think there was something included there on the correlation between women in the police and, and violence, if I recall. Uh, maybe my memory uh, betrays me at this point, but I think we did something like that. But obviously, correlation says nothing about causality and I think you know the, the information needs to be just used in its context and uh, on expanding the language to human security I think you know it's a uh, it's an important discussion to have I think my question there is just to make sure that as we think about expanding the language we don't lose sight mm -hmm. of the women part right uh, to me I think uh, you know obviously I, I think when it comes to when we are talking about Gender, I know that we have pushback in several 
you know, uh, for and CSW being one of them often because the negotiations are always contentious. So, uh, you know, even if we want to uh, expand the language, I think we ha just have to guard against losing what we've achieved in the gender uh, and women, peace and security agenda. And um, again, to me, I think that's, that's really important, an important point to, to, to keep in mind. Thank you very much. Lena? Um, no, the only thing that uh, that I want to say is that we have a lot of work, a lot of work ahead of us, and I think um, I do look forward to continuing the conversation with IPI and with uh, Jennifer and you and women, of course, uh, on how do we bring this home, how do we make this part of the work that we do, um, and how do we make it work for our own advocacy. So, I'm looking forward to the second stage. Thank you. Um, do we have any concluding comments, any additional comments that our colleagues would like to make uh, before we close? Because we're about two minutes away from needing to wind it up. Well, I'd just take the opportunity to thank uh, IPI again and, and the panel. And I think, um, the, and for all of you to come to, for coming today. And um, we very much look forward to your feedback, your continuing feedback. Have a look at the website, dig around. Uh, we have um, email addresses and, and contacts there. Um, and um, kind of watch this space, contribute to this space as well. Um, and um, um, we look forward to, con to continuing the conversation. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah. No. <laughs> Other than just to just say thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this discussion. It's really been a pleasure. Um, so my concluding remarks are unsurprisingly to thank you as the amazing panelists. I think um, it's been a very rich discussion of this wonderful new index and really looking forward to seeing how it grows and develops and how that um, really does continue to and build on and feed into the work of women's rights. Uh, activists and advocates in at the community level. So thank you all so much for attending, for participating, and we're looking forward to second half of next year, I believe it is, uh, the next round. So thank you all very much.